Welcome to Quarantine Creatives. I'm Heath Rosella. So the show's a little over a month old now. Thank you for coming back. If you're new here, welcome. I gotta say, I'm I'm getting more excited all the time. Last week, I talked to Aaron and Ben Napier from HGTV, and I knew they were popular. I mean, they were on the cover of People magazine like a month ago, and I knew people liked their show Hometown. I didn't realize just how popular they were, though. Their show was my number one show by a huge margin. So if you're an Aaron and Ben fan and you're coming back, thank you so much. If you haven't heard that interview yet, go check it out. It uh, It's interesting. It's fun. Talked about old houses and stuff like that. Today, we're going in a completely different direction, I'm going into the comedy world. Payment Benz is my guest today. He's a TV director, Black Monday, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Last Man on Earth. He did a lot of sketch work as well. Who is America? Jimmy Kimmel Live, Key and Peele. Uh, Payment is, uh, he's got a lot of experience and he's got a lot of really cool stories. And I was really excited to talk to him, I think, just to kind of compare notes, you know, director to director. It's interesting because I'm up here in the Boston area. I worked on a nonfiction lifestyle show for a long time, Ask This Old House. I produced and directed that show for the last five years and was with that organization for the last 15. And it's a very different animal than the types of things Payman works on, scripted comedy. So it was fun just to sort of see where our worlds were similar and where they were different. And for me, too, just understanding things like the DGA rules, the Directors Guild. Uh, I'm not a Guild member. The show I was on was non-union, so I'm, I'm not used to dealing with that stuff. So it was fun just to sort of hear how it all works, how many days you get for each part of the job, and how you, how you make the day happen, how you work as a comedy director. It was, it was a fun conversation. It's going to be coming up here in, in just a minute. One thing I just want to say as I'm, as I'm looking out and seeing where we're at on the kind of coronavirus, COVID front, just keep wearing masks, guys. Keep those masks on. I feel like I'm seeing more people just out and about without them. And the thing that that bothers me about it is what the research is telling us is that wearing a mask, it helps you some, but it helps everybody around you so much more. The issue with COVID-19, as I understand it, is that you can be spreading it without having any symptoms. So you may have picked it up at the grocery store or from your mail carrier or your neighbor, whatever. And it might be a week before you have any symptoms, before anyone realizes you have COVID-19 and you're walking around infecting other people. Well, wearing that mask helps keep you from spreading germs around, helps keep you from getting other people sick. Because I get it if you're just thinking, I don't really care if I get it. I should have the freedom or whatever to do that. That's fine. You have, you have the right to get sick if you want. You have the right to, to treat your body how you want. I get that. But the research is telling us that that's not what's happening when you wear a mask. You know, I, I've been out in the neighborhood some this week running some errands, and I feel like mask wearing is, is starting to slip. So keep those masks on. Stay safe, please. The sooner we, uh, we can smother this virus, hopefully the sooner we can get back to normal, right? That's the hope. All right, so Payman Benz, as I said, comedy director. But you'll hear us talk about this new project he's just launched too, which is called Rascal Activism. And he talks a lot about what it is. I'll, I'll let him tell you, I guess. But I guess the lesson there is just we're all looking for ways to, to keep our creativity up, to keep producing, to keep making stuff during this time. And we don't know when it's going to end, so... We got to keep those muscles working. All right, here is my interview with comedy director Payman Benz. How are you, Payman? Good, good. How are you? I'm good. So, how uh, how's the quarantine been treating you? Uh, you know, it's it's been it's been okay. Like I, um, you know, as a director, I'm especially working in TV. I'm used to downtime. Yep. Um, and when I have downtime, I do nothing very well, but you know, it's on, on the quarantine side, I'm fine. I'm just, you know, I have my dog and I talk to friends every day and, you know, I, I definitely miss 
working, but, um, you know, I suddenly got really busy in the last, in the last week as I decided to start like a comedy collective that's going to make like, um, like political, like activism content, like videos and pictures and, and things like that. So like, I'm suddenly doing that from when I wake up to when I go to sleep. Oh, wow. This is um, rascal activism, right? This is, yeah. We, I literally, there's over 50 people in the collective in a week. Oh, wow. Um, I mean, the idea was like, almost a joke 10 days ago and now all of a sudden i'm like we're sending i'm sending out emails i made like a guide on the kind of stuff i want to make and, and there's some like really really great people involved but That's yeah awesome. i mean so i've been just like keeping myself so busy with that because you know i have no idea when i'm going to be filming again right so yeah it's been it, you know it's it's okay i'm definitely you know I'm getting getting stir crazy but i think i'm handling it a little better than some of my friends are but yeah. you know i they're, they're, it's just because i have stuff to do and i have my dog how about you what, what how's it been on your end yeah i mean the same you know I, i've got a wife and, and kids so that both helps distract i guess and <laughs> you know we're in a good setup too like I, I live outside of boston we're in kind of a more rural suburb so i've got close to an acre yard and uh you know so the kids can run around in in the back and just you know play in the grass and stuff and they haven't really missed too much my, my kids are seven and four too so it's like they're okay. not quite old enough you know my daughter just finished first grade this year so like they're not quite at the point yet where it's like i really miss my friends or you know if they were like teenagers i feel like it would be a whole different thing but yeah, yeah right now totally. they don't they don't mind being around us. My, my niece and nephew are the exact same ages and I feel like they're the same. Like yeah. They're like, you know, they talk to their friends on the phone or whatever and like they do some Zoom stuff with their friends but they're not, yeah, there's, there's enough stuff to do at home that it feels like they're, they're getting through. Yeah. It, it's funny you talk about, you know, sort of launching ra rascal activism and it's the same feeling I had with this podcast of sort of like, I had this idea and I just sort of on a whim pitched it to like five or six people a handful of whom were, you know, pretty famous. Scott Foley was my first guest on this show. And I just, mm -hmm. I sent him an email and was like, Hey, I'm thinking of doing this thing. Are you into it? And he emailed me back like 20 minutes later and said, yeah, totally. Let's, let's record. When do you want to do it? And I'm like, okay, I guess I'm launching a show. <laughs> <laughs> that's and, literally. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy how fast it, it happens. But it's, you know, that I feel like that's usually the best stuff is like, you just kind of go, you take a leap of faith and you know, you follow your gut. Like I was first just like reposting stuff where I was like, God, this is some rascal activism here. And I was using the word rascal. It's my favorite word. Yeah. I would just call my friends that. And then I kept posting that. And then my buddy Adam made a logo and sent it to me. And I was like, this is actually kind of sick. And then I was like, wait, should I make this a thing? And then one of my friends was like, yeah, you should make this like a collective. And then I was like, all right, well, that's what I'm going to do with my time now. And then, and then it was like immediately like posting about it, people emailing, like I created like a seven page, like PDF guide on, on, you know, the do's and don'ts. And that's great. Um, and there's some like really, really talented people in it. I'm already planning like the first campaign, but yeah, it is so funny. It was like a, a joke. And then a friend just like, made a, a cool logo and i was just like that's all i needed to see <laughs> okay it's a real thing now it has a logo yeah so. I'm, like, I'm like i guess i'm like all right i'm designing the site i'm copywriting the name or trademarking the name and here we go all that's right awesome. I, don't know what I don't know what this is but it's i'm gonna hopefully try to make it work nice so it'll it'll be it'll be videos and things and it'll it'll have a whole kind of multimedia component it sounds like it's going to be, yeah, it'll be, it'll be videos. You know, right now there's no plans to shoot anything. Yeah. Um, but what I've told the group is like, look, if there's an idea to shoot something that we can do like safe, like so safe that there's like no doubt we can shoot it long lens, I'm open to it. But right now let's just not even think about shooting. We can do enough with existing media and people shooting stuff at home if we need and voiceovers. But I mean, we have like, photographers and photo editors and production designers there's, there's animators there's, there's illustrators so it could be you know making posters that we put around town it could be making videos it could be like you know creating and contributing to memes that are kind of you know going after the you know the the bad people as we put it right um i told everyone i was like look i'll pitch ideas and if people like them they can jump on board and you know, contribute how, you know, if, if I have a need for graphics, if there's some of those graphics, but also if you have ideas for stuff, 
I'll just act as a facilitator and be like, well, okay, this writer performer has an idea who can edit this thing. Right. As long as it's all in this same rascal tone, like, you know, some of it will post on the account initially, but I've also told people like, look, if you have an idea and it's like something that we think could like, you know, go viral, we'll post it on your own thing and then we'll just repost it. I don't want anyone to like give up like right. something that could have like helped them get a job one day. Cause I know how Twitter works. So it's just, it's a very open-ended thing where I'm like, it's just more of like a group of people trying to fight the good fight with comedy. I guess it's the simplest way of putting it. Yeah. Um, and we're all just so, you know, activated and, you know, we're at home and we're watching and we also, there's things we do and I'm like, why don't we do what we do well, but for a good cause. Yeah. Um, it's kind of that and, combination yeah. of, of sort of being stuck at home watching craziness unfold every day for, you know, the last several weeks now and yeah. not having an outlet for it, I think, right? You, you got kind of that perfect, the perfect recipe right now for getting people involved. Absolutely. And it's also, you know, I feel like during this this time, I mean, just more with the pandemic than, than anything else that's going on. It's like, it, it, you know, there was a lot of reflection on like what we do every day. And it's just like, what do I need and not need? What is excess? Like, what is, what's the most, is my job important? Can I do something important with my job? And being like, well, I could scratch that creative itch, but then also like do something about this like feeling I have watching Injustice. I'm like, well, let's let's just try to do something. Yeah. I have no idea if any if this is going to be anything uh, worth anybody's time, but I'm, I'm trying really hard because there's just there's too many good people. I'm like, we can we can make something good. Yeah, and who knows um, what comes so, out of it? That's that's really exciting, actually. Yeah, yeah, totally. We're like, let's just try this. Why not? What else are we going to do? Yeah. Well, so that yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm sort of curious, too, just about like, I think the, the plan in L.A. County was approved, like production can restart like Friday, I think, right, is, is the day. Like, how are you feeling about that? Are you are you ready to <laughs> potentially go back to work or like what? I won't. I mean, it's funny because I posted a thing you know, when they announced that where I was just like, yeah, I'll pass. Yeah. And there's every single response I got was from somebody being like, yeah, there's no way I'm getting on a set right now. Right. Like I know, I know there's some people that, that are probably down to go back. I don't know any of those people, but I'm assuming they are. Yeah. Um, I, I personally like, I can't imagine being comfortable on a set until like maybe November, December. Yeah. I want to see how this is going to be implemented. If it's actually going to be implemented and like what's going to happen in this first round. I just don't know that I, tr I mean, everything I've read either gives me no confidence or, or I think, well, we're just going to make really bad stuff until there's a vaccine. Right. Like, no crowds, no, nobody can be near each other. Everything. So I was just like, you're just going to make some like really weird television. Right. So I'm skeptical. I'm like, I, you know, I mean, sets are just, you know, they call them Petri dishes. I mean, you're just on each other. Yeah. And I just don't know, you know, with the limitations we have to have now because of the virus, but on top of that, checking everybody in all day and keeping everybody separate is going to slow everything down so much that I don't even know how we're going to make days. Like we barely made days when everybody was allowed to be on top of each other. Right. And like, sprinting around set and like you know I, the thing that's been happening at least in single camera comedy the last few years is like the scripts are getting longer and longer and like the days are getting harder and harder to make because the scripts are so overwritten right and they're just they're you know the decisions of cuts are made like in post so now i'm like well these scripts better be really short because right. <laughs> i like with all of the the stuff that's going into this i was just like god like in the past you'd be like can we reset that prop well how do we do that right now does right. everybody have to clear and then you have to wait two minutes like i just I, I can't i can't imagine being comfortable on a set like anytime soon which is a bummer i, I miss it i haven't shot anything since november oh wow um so i mean i did a stand-up special in early march but you know but narrative i haven't shot since like the week before thanksgiving yeah it's, it's kind of con conflicting interest then i'm sure of, of missing that and, and wanting to get back to that but but the version you want to get back to is a 2019 version and not, not the masked up, you know, gloved up everyone six feet apart version. Yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, it just doesn't, it just seems like I know that business runs everything and money. I understand the money aspect, but I'm also like, if one person has that on set and then somebody who has a family is on set, like, I just don't, yeah. know, you know, it's, it's, 
it just it just seems way too risky because um, I don't know where anybody's been. I mean, right. it doesn't matter. I mean, I'm barely leaving the house, but even when I do, I'm like, okay, when was the last time I went to the grocery store? Okay, so okay, it's been. I don't feel anything. It's been 15 days. I didn't get anything, so yeah. <laughs> I can't even like picture being on a set right now. That's how weird it's gotten. Yeah, and, and, and like I don't know about you, but like when I compare notes with family and friends, like everybody has a different version of careful, <laughs> quote unquote. You know, it's like no, yeah. I'm I'm being really careful. Like I just I went out to eat with with some friends the other day, and <laughs> but we sat outside, and I'm like I'm not going out to eat. What are you doing? And, it's like, well, so I went to the grocery store and it was a little crowded in there, but I think it's fine. No one was coughing. And you're just like, OK, like we've oh, been doing like grocery God. delivery and like not even, you know, I've been to maybe, I don't know, five stores <laughs> since March or something. Like It's been a long yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was getting deliveries for a bit and then there's a there's a grocery store near me that is like it's very spacious and they only let in a certain amount of people at a time. Yeah. And, um, and you're, everybody really follows the, the rule. Like even like they basically have everybody line up around like the, the edge and then they'll tell you which check stand to go to. So like nobody is like on top of each other at the check stand, yeah. even there, like now they're offering like pickup. So I'm like, Oh, I'll just order my stuff and go pick it up yeah. and not go inside. But yeah, I've been like, I mean, I, you know, I, a lot of my friends are being very careful, but I think I'm getting a reputation for being like the most careful right. at this point. But just, uh, yeah, if you're, like, if you're around a bunch of people, they're like, oh yeah, no, we're all being careful. And you're like, well, are you though? <laughs> you know, that's, that's the part that scares me about going back to work. Yeah, exactly. Cause yeah, like you're right. Everybody has a different definition of it. And you know, I see people, I'll be walking my dog and, you know, the classic thing I see now is somebody has a mask that's like under their chin. And then when right. they see somebody with a mask, they pull it up so right. they don't get called out. And you're like, you're not, you're help, you're hurting everybody. It's right. like, it's not that difficult. Just put it on. Nobody's taking your freedoms away. We're trying to live, dude. Right. Like, good God. And it's, it's for hard. everyone. I mean, yeah, like you said, it's, it's like, if we all everyone. do it, you're not spreading it. You're not getting it. It's just, and hopefully it goes away yeah. sooner. Just like the quicker we all like, play ball the quicker we get back to regular life if not like it's just going to keep going yeah I, I wanted to kind of compare notes with you that's part of why i was really excited to talk to you because i'm i'm a director as well but my background is in lifestyle you know i, I worked at this old house for a long time I, I actually like it's it's weird because i only really my professional experience is is in this old house i, I worked there for 15 years and I started as a PA and kind of worked up through the ladder and, you know, became a producer at one point and then, you know, produced and directed and, and directed for the last five years. But it was all it's all single camera. It's all process based. You know, you, you don't know going into it sort of exactly what's going to happen. Like when you when you tear into a wall, you might find exactly what you expect or it might be something completely different. And so you're kind of you're, you're crafting the story on the fly and trying to figure out, OK, like how do how do I shoot coverage in a way that gives me enough options when I get back to edit that like you know if I if I want to take this thing for a long walk and you know have a three minute discovery thing I can or if I want it to be right. twenty seconds you know I can but just like I I feel like there's a lot of similarities to what we do but there's mm -hmm. probably a lot of differences too so just like very broadly like how do you see your role as a director when you're working on a on a comedy. Um, I mean, for me, it's, uh, you know, when I'm, when I'm on these shows, like, you know, I, 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 at this point I've done it for, I think six years now I've been doing single camera comedy. Like I'm pretty much almost any show I work on now. Like I know some writers or I know the showrunner, I know someone and they know that I'm like a comedy nerd. So yeah. they, they, they let me, you know, the shows usually give me like a lot of flexibility. I mean, I'm, I'm constantly making everybody like, hyper aware of my plans just because like i don't want to be on set where they're like wait sorry what are you doing right um because we don't even have time for that discussion usually <laughs> so yeah for me it's like you know i i nerd i mean if if a show that i'm on has been on already i've been on a lot of new shows but if it's a show that's been on i watch the whole thing i'll watch every episode and then i'll just make sure that i'm making their show and adding my little, you know, whatever I can add to it without making, making it feel different. Right. And I'm always asking like, 
you know, what do you see with the sequence? Do you want this to be a long thing? Do you want this to be short? Should I cut down a sheet leather? Or like, you know, can I try a version where we play this scene out a little more? So like, I'm my thing is I'm just constantly asking because, you know, I, I spent so much time prepping that, you know, if I prep something and don't tell anyone and then on the day they get rid of it, I'm like, oh my God, I spent so much time doing that. Right. And what, so, are, what yeah, does prepping it, look yeah. like? Can I, can I, it just sort of like when, when you're, when you get a script, how much, how much work are you doing in pre-pro? A, a lot. I mean, I do i mean i think we, most of us do a lot i know some directors don't like prep i actually love it just because like i'm just constantly you're just getting questions answered so like i'll get the script usually about a week before prep yeah um in general i'll get four days of prep for five days of shooting okay um prep usually starts on tuesday usually the first thing we do is like they call it the director scout but that's basically usually the director looking at the locations the producers have already decided on yeah but you're basically there to just be like yes this does work or no we have to look for something else and then we do like it's just a series of meetings we do like a concept meeting on tuesday with like all the department heads and um, it's usually Tuesday because it's, it's very important that it's the first day of prep and right. it's all the department heads and the showrunner and the writer. And they basically, the AD runs the meeting and we kind of just go scene by scene and, you know, they're just asking questions of the writer and showrunner. Okay. Well, if you're at a picnic, like what kind of picnic are we envisioning? And it just kind of gives everybody like some info to go, you know, start pulling options. Right. And then, you know, the director will chime in a little bit, but it's, it's also, that's a very educational meeting. Cause like, that's when I'm learning what they had in mind, but then I'll always pitch stuff. If I saw it a little differently, I'm like, well, wouldn't it be funny if we're if, funnier if we did this. And then as the week goes, it's just chipping away at other meetings, you know, with, you know, production designer, or sometimes with wardrobe, depending on the show. And then, you know, eventually we have the tech scout, and the production meeting on usually Thursday and then Friday is when I'll have the tone meeting with the showrunner and the and the writer when, you know, they're quite literally telling me what they want me to do. Or at least they'll say, all right, with this scene, the whole point is that we get to this point and I need, you know, him or her to be frustrated at this line because this is going to happen. You're basically getting all the behind the scenes cliff notes. Right. And then, then I can finalize my prep over the weekend where I'm like, okay, so he does see that as being a sequence. So I'm going to, you know, plan a sequence now for this. Or, you know, a lot of times in that tone meeting, they'll just be like, so how are you thinking about doing this? So yeah, you're just kind of getting the last bits of info. So it's really just like gathering information to like, make your plan as clean as possible for when you shoot. So like I end up, my prep weeks are like really busy. I usually don't get much, much rest. Yeah. And especially in that weekend is when I'm doing like a lot of the final work. And is that just so, sort yeah. of laying out like, you know, I, I know that I need, I need a wide shot to get, to get these two characters in. Then I want to get, you know, singles on both of them. I need a reaction of what they're seeing, you know, like, uh, and maybe I want a, an overhead for one, you know, just sort of figuring out, kind of shot by shot what what the coverage is going to look like or the plan of the day yeah yeah it's kind of all of it like the first thing i'll do with shots is like i'll do like a preliminary like wish list shot list a shot list of the entire episode and then um of just like here's all the shots that i would love to get yeah and then uh and then i once we have the schedule i then separate those then by day and then try to see like oh wait Tuesday does not look doable. Yeah. So that's what I try to talk to the AD about moving stuff, or that just means I have to, you know, we have like nine too many setups. So now I have to figure out a new way of blocking that scene or what's a, what's a shot I could give up. You know, I'm trying to envision the edit when I'm, when I'm prepping because I don't want to waste time on set. And right. if I need a shot for literally one second, you know, I'll shoot three seconds of it and then move on. Cause you just like never have time. So it's a lot of that. And then, yeah, mapping it out. And then, you know, I literally, for, there's a lot of scenes where it's just like two people land on their marks and talk. But, you know, for scenes where there's a little more movement, I literally will act them out alone in my apartment to just anticipate the things that might come up from the actor. Right. And then just other things where I'm like, wait a minute, he's in the background the whole time. Wouldn't he be reacting to this stuff? Because like, you know, I learned, you know, you learn early on, like, oh, you have to really anticipate everything. So it's a lot of that. It's a lot of like reblocking and, and reimagining and, and, you know, trying to figure out like what's, 
what's the least amount of shots where I can like tell this story. Right. right. Then I'll add two more just to like give us some flexibility. But a lot of it is like, I just want to make sure the editor has what they need and enough to go with. So like, yeah, a lot of my prep is just, it's, it's mainly the shot stuff, but then it's, it's always like, how do I fit this into a day where I don't stress out the line producer? Right. And just, um, yeah. And, and kill everyone too. Just, you know, yeah, I don't, too like, many setups. Or, wanna, yeah. Yeah. The la- that's the last thing I want to do is like kill my crew. And then like, you know, I, it's the worst because like, you know, if you know a shot is probably not crucial, like pull the plug. Right. Like, like I, especially when my days are getting longer, when I have those wish list shots where I'm like, you know what, let's be honest, they're going to lose this shot. And everybody is like burned out. I know how we're going to cut this later. We have to just move on. You just can't have an ego because right. you can't, you're a hired gun. You're here to make their show. So, you know, if you're willing to lose stuff and like without it really hurting you and affecting your mood, like, I think you can thrive at that job. Cause it's just like, all right, let's get the, Let's get the best thing we can possibly get right. is, is, is kind of the goal. And, and like, um, I wonder, too, when you're coming into, you know, these established shows, you know, you've, you've done work on like Brooklyn Nine-Nine or Last Man on Earth or, you know, just sort of coming into shows that they have a feel, they have a rhythm, they have, a, you know, just a, a workflow, I guess, that you're uh, you in some ways have to keep going, I guess. But like i guess just sort of how how do you find your your sea legs uh on a show that's you know already up and running yeah i mean it's you know the i think the first time the first time i did brooklyn because I, I, the first like single camera thing i got like hired on was last man on earth uh-huh. and of, of like an existing show and um i was already like a massive fan of season one and i knew that show like front and back like yeah. i had watched the first season so many times that like you know somebody would go oh in season one we did this thing and i'm like no 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 actually you did this <laughs> um i was like no no you started on the insert i know that edit um yeah it's really just like once you know the show then you're just kind of a lot of it is you know, the the DP and the script supervisor and your AD are like your best friends on set because yeah. a, a lot of times, especially when I would start on a show like that, is I would literally ask, usually in prep, but on set I would be like, would you guys ever do a shot like this? And if the answer is no, I don't get it. Right. You're not really giving performance notes. You're giving like maybe motivation notes, but you're never like the, they, the actors know their characters like better than anybody. Right. So like, if there's very little, you know, especially when I'm on like Brooklyn, like I'm not going up to like Andy to be like, why don't we do it? It's never like that. It's usually technical. It's usually like, oh, you know, it'd be great if you turned here because that's going to help this. And yeah. uh, one thing I learned in the tone meeting is this is going to actually set up a later joke. So if you could do something that like, that kind of helps that come across. So a lot of it is you're not really a, a director like you think you normally are. Like you are directing the show, but you're not like, it's not, you're not an auteur. You're just yeah. like, it's different than film ex- directing. It's totally different because yeah. your job in this is like execute this show instead of like make your vision. So, and like, if, and I feel like if you know the show, it's not difficult. Like I could be at monitors and be like, this feels like Brooklyn nine, nine, or I could be like, this doesn't feel anything like it. What are we doing wrong? So it's, you know, it's, it's tough. Again, you just have to like drop any shred of an ego that you have. Like I, <laughs> I as somebody who's done film the whole career, going to TV, I'd imagine it's like a shock to the system. So they're like, wait, sorry, the writer is the one that has the final say. And then, but when you're there, you get it. You're like, well, yeah, they work on the show. Like right. they know the show. <laughs> like, so yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky, but you know, I, I just, I love comedy and I used to do so much sketch and I'm always about like best idea wins. So like I, I, you know, episodic direction is like fun for me. I love it. It's also like a fun puzzle. It's kind of cool to like make an episode of an existing show. And then when it works really well, you just, you know, that's, it's, 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 yeah, it's fun. It just feels like a, a, a cool thing where you're like, you know, I, these people had a show and I came on and collaborated with them and, and they, they felt good about the episode. That's a, it's a, it feels like a victory. Yeah. And I feel um, like so much of it is just sort of about, it's about making the people around you happy and getting invited back mm-hmm. for the next one. <laughs> like it's not, it's, oh, just, it's yeah. not about your ego necessarily, or like, Oh, this is going to look great on my reel. It's like, all right, we got to get to the finish line today and make everyone feel like they went home at a decent hour and they got what yeah. they needed. And you know, maybe they'll invite me back you, for another one. Yeah. Like, you, like if you get, if you get what 
they want you to get and you're and you're cool and like you're good to the crew and you're good to the talent and you're just easy to work with like you have to try really hard to mess an episode up because there are so many people there that can pick you up if you're stumbling like like i said the ad the script supervisor the dp the editor like you have to really do a bad job to do a bad job. Right. And like generally if a director is not being asked back, it's because something was going on with their personality and they rub people the wrong way. Yeah. Um, it's the stories I hear about other directors where I'm like, why don't you bring that guy back? And they're like, Oh yeah, well he snapped at one of the actors. And I was mm. like, Well, there it is. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's a lot of that. You just have to be cool to work with, which is, you know, more and more, I think the thing, that I see in the industry is even like when I'm putting stuff together, I'm like, well, who do I want to spend 12 hours with every right. day? I'd rather work with someone who's like pretty damn talented and cool than like a genius who's like a jerk. Like, I don't want that person on set or someone who like makes people uncomfortable. Totally. Like, um, and I feel like that's becoming more of a thing. I feel like as you're seeing people, you know, I have friends and you start to see them run shows and you're like, oh, wow, they have like only good people around. This is great. Yeah. Well, I think um, as, as you're coming up too, you sort of, you identify who those people are that, that you just kind of vibe well with. And you're like, oh yeah, you know, I want to bring them along <laughs> the next project I do. And you start kind of building that team and then, you know, it travels and it changes, uh, you know, between projects. Yeah. But yeah, the the more you can kind of work with, with like-minded people or, or even if they challenge you, I guess, just people that, that you get along with, that you enjoy spending time with. Yeah, but even if we do have a disagreement, like, can we come to an agreement in, like, a rational way? Or is this person, like, you know, have such an ego that he's just going to, like, make everyone's day uncomfortable? Yeah. Like, there's always a way to figure it out. There's no reason to yell. Like, I refuse to yell on set. It just seems so crazy. Especially in comedy, it seems crazy. To- I can't even imagine getting that mad on set. Right. Because it doesn't help anyone. Like, everybody... When you have the everybody on on edge, I just don't know how anyone does their job. You, you actually start to see people become clumsy and like bump into stuff because like the energy is totally off on set, and then the angry person gets angrier. Right. <laughs> like this is crazy, man. Go take a lap. Yeah, it's it's why you know because I always say like our jobs are ridiculous. These are stupid jobs to have. We're right. very lucky to have them. Every time I would drive to work, I'd be like, why am I allowed to do this for a living? So like being like going to work and then being like unpleasant just seems like very spoiled behavior. Yeah, no, totally. <laughs> like, we all have our days, but people that have like reputations for just notoriously being like cruel to people, you're like, why are you even doing this? Right. Like, I don't even, like, why don't you just go do another job? It sounds like you're unhappy, man. Yeah. <laughs> like, we can have fun doing this. So let's, let's yeah, try to, like yeah. we're having a, we, we're doing great without your negative vibes. So right, like just right. get out of here. Man. Right. Uh, I'm yeah. curious too, as, as you were talking about just sort of figuring out coverage and, and knowing like, you know, what, what, what is and isn't going to make it. How, how involved are you in the post-production process? Do you completely hand it off or, or do you get to sit with an editor and all and, and sort of figure out? you know, what, how, how to get to a completed episode. Yeah. So like with the DGA rule, the director is given two days to work with the editor. Okay. So by the time I get in there, they have sent me the editor's cut, like a fully assembled cut, yep. which is usually, usually about a, like a week. Like usually we shoot Monday through Friday. I'll usually get it Wednesday night and then go in Thursday, Friday to edit. And if I can't go, uh, in person, I just do it through email, but you're given two days of like giving notes basically. Gotcha. And then I'll get those two days, uh, that I'll work with the editor and then the director's cut goes out. And then that's where my involvement is over. Okay. Um, and then at that point, like the, cause then by that point, then it's like producers network. Like there's so many cooks at that point that it's like, you gave them your cut and now, you know, they're going to do whatever they're going to do with it. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll um, I, you know, I, if I have specific stuff in mind, I'll put it in there. Sometimes I'll, once I see a cut, I'm like, yeah, that doesn't work. Let's just do it the regular way. And a lot of times I'm like, I know, like I won't burn the editor out if I know that that showrunner is like very particular, which is not necessarily negative. It's like some showrunners know exactly how they're going to cut the show. So I'll be like, Hey, I'm just going to give you like the trims and the stuff that I think we absolutely have to do. But I'm not going to go crazy on this scene because I know he's going to come in and change all of this. Right. Um, And the last thing I want is the editor to spend like another two hours with me. That's going to be undone. Right. And you're not looking, uh, are you, are you looking at at story points at that point or is it primarily just sort of coverage and and making sure the rhythm is correct and that sort of thing? You're you're not like, Oh, that joke's kind of fallen flat or, 
you know, that, that sort of thing. It's kind of, yeah. A lot of it is like, yeah. Are the jokes working? Like, how do we, yeah. How do, how do we make this joke funnier? How did the timing is off sometimes? Like a lot of times it's just like little trim, some technical stuff, story stuff. I'll, I'll usually leave to them, but I'll like leave notes for the editor. I'm like, gotcha. pass this along that I'm worried that this story isn't coming through or that I don't even think we need this detail. Right. There's some stuff that I'm like, if I don't want to necessarily, you know, waste everybody's time by working it out, I'll be like, here's some questions I have or some stuff that I, that I'm not sure about. If you want to pass along to the show. Or yeah. More just uh, like as a viewer, like I, I don't understand where this is coming from, but yeah, just, yeah. I'll be like, yeah, I don't know, man. Do we even need this? This, this scene, I know it's a runner, but like, what is this even buying us? Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, especially if I've been on the show like enough times, like they're, you know, I, I, they know me, I can give more, you know, I can probably say more than someone that they don't know. And I just be like, yeah, I just don't think this is funny. Is yeah. there something we can do with this joke? But kind of the um, joke, the joke stuff is more editorial issues. It's, you know, you're cutting to that reaction too quickly or there's too much of a pause in there. It's that sort of like edit tweaks as opposed to writing tweaks at that point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because you by that point, with the, that's the, like the writing side is like so figured out. Right. But then, you know, but there are times where, you know, you'll be looking at the edit and you're like, I don't know that this story is like working. What if we reordered it or do we need to add that, you know, so sometimes it's like pitching, adding something that they would shoot at a later date. Like, I don't know, do we need a little quick 20 second scene between these two to set this thing out? Because this storyline came out of nowhere. Right. So, yeah, it's it's pretty. Yeah, I mean, it's all over. But it's generally because the editors are so good. I mean, they work on the show. So, they, you, you know, you get some really good good editor cuts and you know they'll do stuff that you weren't even anticipating that's like above and beyond anything you even thought was possible with the scene um and then it's just like yeah it's just some tweaks and tightening and you know not losing too much because you want to make sure that they're able to see everything because you know there, there's always the danger of like if you cut a bit out they may just want it back in and then they lose something else that may have been stronger but it's just because they saw it in that way it made yeah. them you know feel that way so i a lot of times i'll be like i don't want to cut this but if you want to leave a note that i think you could cut from this point straight to this line gotcha um so I'd, yeah I'm, 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 i I plant a lot of seeds <laughs> as i'm leaving the uh the, as i'm leaving post right in terms of going back to set for a minute like working with actors you you sort of said before that you're not really shaping the characters like you know the, the people that are playing these these characters week in week out they sort of know, they know that character better than you do coming in. But there must be times where, I don't know, do, do you ever, like, you, you see it on the monitor and you're just like, something's off, you know? They're, they're, not, they're not getting it today or something's not clicking. Or, like, I, I just wonder sort of how you deliver those kind of notes or if you just have to sort of figure out, like, does that even fall to you or is that a showrunner's job or someone else's job to sort of figure out, no. like, what's going well, on that you- day? Usually when that is happening, when a thing is not working, usually like the writer and I will go and like have a discussion gotcha. with the actor. Yeah. Sometimes the, the, you know, the writer will give me a note and I'll be like, I'll go figure this out. For me, like, I don't like calling out from monitors generally only for like pickups or like joke pitches. Yeah. But in general, if I'm giving someone a note, like I go up and try to have like a quiet chat with them because yeah. I just don't need, you know, they don't need an audience when they're being like essentially critiqued. Right. So, um, but I feel like almost any time I've like gone up to an actor and talked about something not working, they know before you even get there. Right. And like you go and they're like, this isn't working right. I'm like, yeah. So how do we, what do we do? How do we play? This is the motivation. And then we'll just kind of play with it. For me, what's always worked is just like, just having a straight up conversation and never coming from a place of like judgment or disappointment because like you can feel the vulnerability, like you'll call cut and it's just like kind of a weird feeling on that and I like see this look on the actor's face where I'm like oh my god she feels awful right now I have to go talk to her right um and then because you know you just don't want anyone to lose confidence you're like it's not you like we're figuring this out (laughs) it's fine yeah I think just I I I just I just try to have like really honest conversations and be like let's you know and I think it's also the language that you use it's just like instead of like you or you know I always use the word like let's and we like let's figure this out right um you're not alone in this it's not on you so yeah, but they, yeah, I mean, it happens, but but they're pretty, man, they're, when the show's been on, though, they're pretty unbelievable. Yeah. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty fun to watch. 
Yeah. And, and I guess, like you say, it's about making a collaborative too and not, uh, not antagonistic. It's not you versus them. It's, it's let's figure this out. Uh, I, I wonder too, yeah. when you're, when you're pushing for something that, I, I, I don't know, in my experience anyways, there, there are times where the, the talent feels like they've gotten something in two takes and you want to push for that third or you want to push for a fourth take. Like, h- how do you balance that of sort of them feeling like they've gotten it and you seeing it and saying, we're not there yet. And just, I, I, I like, I feel like that's such a delicate dance of, and it's so subjective. It, it, yeah. I mean, it's, I, yeah, it's really, it, it just depends. I mean, there's certain actors where they'll, they'll be like, wait, why are we getting another one? Yeah. And you're like, well, there's just, I'm looking for this one thing or I need like a technical thing or whatever. But you know, there's some actors who, you know, whether it's their personality or they've just been doing it so long that you're just kind of like, Nope, he's done. He's not going to give us another one. Yeah. And you just have to move on. So I think a lot of it is just kind of knowing who you're, who you're dealing with. And, you know, there's certain, you know, sometimes you'll get a guest star come in and they're coming in as almost a favor. And you're like, I can't, I can't right. poke this guy. Yeah. Um, because I've, you know, it hasn't happened to me, but I've heard of stories where somebody like, you know, asked for a couple more takes from someone and they like essentially sabotaged the take on purpose. Oh, wow. Just as like a protest. <laughs> we were like, okay, <laughs> whatever. We're all adults, but yeah. sure, you can act like that. Yeah. But yeah, I think, I think it's always different. It just depends. I mean, I definitely had to like explain like why we were doing another take to, to people, but normally they get it where I'm like, ah, it's not you. I just have to think of this other thing and I we have to have options. And, yeah. um, and a lot of times I will, if, if it's something that we're like close, but like, if I give another note, that actor is going to get in their head or get mad. I'll literally just say, Oh, we had a technical issue on right. that one yeah. and just give them another take because that way it doesn't affect their confidence because that's the last thing I want. Because then they're like, what are you talking about? We just did four takes. What do right. you mean I'm not getting it? Well, I'll be like, oh, we had a little buzz on the monitor. If we could just do one more. And then like usually you get it on that take. And then you're like, yes, I never yeah, have to talk. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it just, it just depends on who you're working with. Also, you know, they're, they're, the actor's jobs are are tough, man. That's a weird job to have. Yeah. Yeah. Get there all early and then everybody's staring at you and like, yeah, that's just, that's strange. So I'm like, whatever I can do to keep their confidence up. I'm, I'm, it's, it's, I'll, I'll try anything. Yeah. It, it's so funny just to like, you know, my, my experience is all kind of with amateur talent. Like, you know, the, the, the hosts of the show and stuff have been there a long time, but they're effectively real contractors. You know, they're, they're TV stars. <laughs> kind of by night, I guess, right. you know, and then yeah. we're, we're working with like homeowners that have never been on TV before. And so it's always this, this really delicate dance of, as you say, sort of trying to figure out if you give, if you give a note, that's really the problem, are they going to get too self-conscious about it and just make the problem worse? So then do you mm-hmm. figure out just like, oh yeah, no, I think the audio dropped out on that. I'm sorry. We, we just had a mic issue. Let's try one more. Or like, you know, I, I don't know if you get into this at all, because, again, with with actors, I feel like they're 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 just professional. It's it's what they do for a living. But like coming in with a bottle of water to break the tension or, you know, changing out the mm-hmm. media on the camera, even if you've got an hour left on the car, it's just yeah. something to sort of like, you know, let's take a breather for us. Let's get out of the heat of the, you know, another one, another one, another one. And just, you know, if we all have a second to to get out of our own heads and then, you know, come back into it. And and not feel like it's the people in front of the camera that are the problem. Just like, no, you guys were good, but yeah, it's just, I I, I want to make sure we got it. I think there may have been a thing. Did you did you bump the iris on that shot? No. Okay. Well, it, yeah. I, it looked like it. It looked. Let me try one more just to be sure. You know. Yeah, totally. I mean, because it's all. I mean, it's all in the name of just like protecting the actor and their their you know how they're feeling at the time because they have to feel confident. Right. So yeah, that stuff I've done a lot, or you know, a lot of times if things just not working. Instead of saying it's not working, I'll be like, that was great. Let's try one like this as yeah, an option. Right. And then all that does is loosen them up. And right. then like, you'll end up getting like an unbelievable thing. Cause like, especially once you've done it a bunch of times, like I, I can only imagine as an actor, even if you're doing multiple angles, like you must be like, I'm doing this thing, the same thing every time I, I want to do something different. Right. It's just like the natural like performer in them, which is like, it's good, but it's also in comedy can be dangerous. Right. And, you know, people start to go bigger and bigger and the crew starts laughing harder and harder, but that's because 
it's an inside joke to us. We've been watching all the takes that this, this line has evolved from like whispering to screaming. Right. But then when you put it into the edit, you're like, sorry, why is he screaming? Yeah. <laughs> you're like, Oh no, dude, all the takes you just kept getting louder. You're like, well, no one cares. Right. <laughs> put that in a show. Right. Man, I miss it. Dude, the more we're talking, the more I'm like, God, I miss being on set. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so well, but, much. but again, it's like, it's, it's a whole different reality out there, right? Like the world has just completely yeah. changed in three months that it's like, hey, I yeah, I want to go back to that other thing. I want, I want to get, in a time machine yeah. and go there i don't want to i don't want to go there right now just uh, talking about sort of like the vibe on set you know th- there's one uh segment that you did in particular that I'm, I'm really curious about and i'm not sure how much you can even talk about it but uh the sasha baron cohen show who is america like the, the <clears throat> gun control segment you you directed that right with like the uh yes yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was crazy. Like I remember watching that like when it went viral whenever, you know, 2 years ago, 3 years ago, whenever whenever that had aired and just thinking like, "Whoa, this is insane." And like it's it's this guy who's like a like a gun rights advocate that he's he's sitting down and getting interviewed by Sasha and sort of talking about like this program, Sasha's character is this Israeli guy that is saying, you know, in Israel we give guns to, you know, 4-year-olds and this guy's like, "Yeah." That's a great idea. And just, so like there's the interview portion of it, which is like, OK, like you get him to go along with that. But then there's this whole kind of fake commercial <laughs> where he's endorsing this idea with all these guns kind of dressed up as as different you know, toys, stuffed animals. <laughs> and <laughs> like it's against a green screen. Like I, I wonder how you maintain that act, just sort of knowing like what has to go into it, that it's not a you know, a quick five minute reset, unless it is, unless the green screen is just kind of built there and you're just like, okay, we got to move before this guy is onto us and figures out it's all a ruse. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Well, let me think, cause there's only so much I can say about the production, Yeah. but as far as that goes, we did the sit down interview first and then the green screen was like down the hall and, but it was already lit and yeah. we basically just moved cameras and started shooting but I will say that dude was so gung ho that we didn't have to, we didn't have to ask him to do anything. Yeah. Like he, cause at one point he was saying something like he was trying to, he's like a big gun rights activist. I think his name's Phil Van Cleef. He's always would be on TV talking about, you know, more guns, more guns. Right. He had pitched a thing where they tried to get a bill across that was going to like, lower the age of like who could shoot a rifle yeah and like and he was really like he was thinking like pretty low he was like this is great i just tried to get something like this passed and we were like what we didn't even know that (laughs) and then like he was just like i mean you know every time we were done with one of the gun toys he would be like wait wait wait, wait, we forgot to do the safety part and then he's like all right so then you pull on this and then you and like he was just giving us gold that we weren't even asking for yeah, that was just kind of magic, man. That dude, just like we just happened to get a guy that like actually thought it was a great idea. Yeah, it was it was truly insane. Yeah. I couldn't. I, I as it was unfolding, I was like, I can't. Like even though I was there, I was like, how is is this real? <laughs> like what's going on here? Right. And I'm like, no, these people are real. He just all all his characters do is he makes people comfortable enough to say the things they believe. Like right. he's not getting, he's not forcing any. I saw enough of the. You know, I only did a couple pieces on that show and then, you know, a little bit when they were developing the idea. But I saw a lot of like daily in the edits and he doesn't force anyone to say anything. People right. very much volunteer that stuff. And I'm like, that's, that's why they can't argue it. Yeah. They're like, he didn't. Did you hear what he asked you? And then you said that? What are you talking about? But I just um, feel like so much yeah. of it is like it, it's built on the premise that we're in agreement. Right. And like like when when you have a guy that crazy just sort of spouting off his views, you know, for, for a cameraman to not break for an audio guy, you know, just there, you know, 10, 12 people around off camera that probably feel the complete opposite way (laughs) that this guy does, but he thinks he's in a sympathetic room. Like everybody's got to maintain that, that character the whole time, I guess. Right. That, that we're all in agreement. Yeah. The the crew is like, yeah, I don't, I don't think I've ever heard of a, again, I was only there for a couple of the shoots, but I don't, remember ever hearing a story about the, the crew cracking because I think it's like, you know, we, you, we have one shot to get this. You right. can't mess it up. You just got to make sure you're doing your job well. And I think everybody is so focused on whether they're holding focus or holding the frame or the boom is in the right spot. Like nobody wants to mess up. And then it just ends up being this like 
unit that that like never yeah i don't feel like i've ever heard a story about them cracking which is crazy because it's some of the funniest stuff you've right. ever seen on set right but yeah it's just like and you know we all just i, I think everybody outside just like really believes in what what is happening and where you know what, what could you know possibly be you know what could you know be exposed or what somebody may say that when it happens it's just like all right like go with it go yeah. with it we'll talk about this later right. <laughs> like well that's you, we you raffle, want them we'll all laugh. yeah you you want the guests to leave still thinking that that they were in a sympathetic place i think you you directed the roy moore thing too and and he kind of walks yes. out at the end yeah. of that and like i feel like that's the ending you don't necessarily want right yeah i mean i you know that one too like i just didn't you know i had no clue what was going to happen right there. and it literally could not have played out that i mean it was like just like frame perfect comedy that didn't even need to be edited yeah because I just remember being a monitor being like, oh, I'm watching like a classic moment right yeah. now. Like, how right. did this happen? Yeah. When he's, I don't, I like, I definitely didn't anticipate storming out. I thought he would like stay there. And I mean, he was there longer than he says he was, but right. um, that was a crowning achievement to just be involved <laughs> with that one. Cause well, he's nobody effect- likes that guy. Yeah. And he, he's effectively, Sasha's calling him a pedophile to his face several times. Like if anyone hasn't seen the segment, he, he has this, this detector it's, it's like a, a um like a metal detector that he says picks up on uh like the pheromones or whatever that that only pedophiles give off and he he rubs it on himself or you know over himself and nothing and then he rubs it over roy moore and it starts beeping he says oh well that that's wrong let me let me try it again no huh that's weird let me bring a crew member in and i wand him and, huh okay you know and and he's just kind of sitting there the whole time and just like huh yeah but That's... and it is, uh, but what in the two shot as that was unfolding, I saw his like hand start to close almost in like a oh, tense really? fist. Yeah, and I point at it at because I was in a different room and I'm right. pointing at it like, and we're all like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, what's about to happen? And uh, is this then, the, yeah. the accusations against him had come out at that point, right? He was, was he he was running for Senate at that point, and like this, this was no, this was like way after it was already everybody knew he was a pedophile gotcha. at that point. So, <laughs> um, and I think it had been so long since anyone had like done anything or messed with him that you know I think his guard was down. I don't even remember how they I don't even remember how they got him there. I don't know. It's all, I mean, there was so much of it that was even still a mystery to me, which I kind of liked it that way. I didn't get a full peek. I was just behind the curtain. I was just like, let me just, I'll just capture it the way you guys want to capture it. Yeah. Just making sure you get the shots. Yeah. Because like, you, yeah, you can't, you know, that's why we would shoot it very simply because you're like, you just got to make sure you're getting it because you don't know where anybody's going to go. Right. Though, again, we did not anticipate them leaving. So we were not prepared for that. But yeah, it was a very, very, uh, very, a special thing to even be, you know i had the smallest role in that show but i yeah. had such a good time on it you you get you got on some good segments that's for sure <laughs> yeah oh i got lucky i really got lucky with the ones they gave me yeah so the the one last thing i want to ask you about you know we were talking before about kind of coming into uh to existing workflows and and sort of existing shows uh the the latest thing i think that you've worked on is the show robbie that was it was on comedy central and then uh it was was it eight episodes total that, that kind of went up was- online it, it went on like they, they aired the pilot and then they just put the whole thing online. It was just, it was like a big executive shuffle like right, gotcha. right as we finished that show. Yep. And then, um, you know, there was discussions about trying to take it elsewhere because it's just, it's a very different tone than anything they've done. Right. And then, you know, in the middle of the pandemic, it was like, all right, I, we have this content. Should we just put it out? Yeah. <laughs> and they just, so like the whole, all eight episodes, like a full 21 minute, you know, episode show and they're all on, their comedy central youtube and um you know it's a that's a really great show i'm really proud of it yeah I, I, i've seen three or four so far i haven't i haven't made it all the way through the series but I, i'm just curious oh, nice. like when you get a new project like that when you're you know you're directing the pilot and sort of defining the look for the series like how does that change from from just coming into something that's kind of an already baked cake it, it's it was very different it was it and and they you know the showrunner was anthony king and obviously rory and uh, Scott Moran and, and um, let's see, it was Owen Burke and Betsy Koch. It was a Gary Sanchez. Like I went and met with them. I think it was like a few months before they were shooting the pilot. Like they had the deal. They just hadn't gotten the director yet. Yeah. And I read the script and I flipped out. I was like, Oh my God, my dad was a soccer coach. So like this basketball coach dad thing is so funny to right. me. And, uh, and I'm a nut about basketball. So I was like, I have to direct this pilot. 
So I went in and met with them and I was just like, here's what I think it should look like. And then they were like, oh my God, yes, that's what it's supposed to look like. And it, like Rory told me later, he's like, yeah, we didn't really talk about the look until that day. Yeah. And then I pitched it and they were into it. And I made like a little look book and then, you know, I picked it. They were really excited with the DP I got, which is um, my friend Carl Hersey, who shot Last Man on Earth and he shoots Black Monday and he's just a wonderful DP. And we were so lucky to get him on, you know, on a show with that budget. Right. And then it was, he saw the script the same way I saw it. Like when we talked about what it should look like, it was like we were using the same language. And what, what, what did that um, pitch sound like? Like what, when you, when you saw that look together, what, what was that look? How did you define it? Like it was, I mean, we were kind of, we were basically like, we want the sports, like we want the actual basketball to feel like Friday night lights. Cause there is a Friday night lights out, like vibe to the show a little bit, Yeah. but we saw, we saw like a very natural looking show with like cinematic sequences which like they did a good job of writing scenes where you're like oh this should feel like a movie and in the pilot there's a scene in the bowling alley where like we just went crazy with coverage yeah, right where we really wanted to make it like a fun thing but it was like you know my whole thing is like i wanted it to feel natural i wanted natural blocking i wanted like natural lighting i wanted everybody's clothes to be like faded so it looked like they had owned them for a while because my pet peeve is like on tv everybody's clothes is like off the rack right brand new um, and perfectly pressed and yeah br- yeah we're like early on in prep i was like hey what do you guys think if like we literally have a wardrobe for every character so we start to see some of the same pieces over and over because mm. i know everybody i know in real life only has a certain number of shirts right. like like if you watch a show that goes on for six, seven seasons, you're like, how big are these people's closets, right. man? I've never seen this person wear the same thing twice. I was like, what if we grounded this? A lot of it was like building the world and wanting like it to feel dusty and sweating and grimy. And then it was just like, you know, how do we cover this in the most like a, a way that feels special and cinematic, but still like loose. Yeah. So, you know, the show had like a cool handheld feel, but we also introduced steady cam and you know, I basically, I mean, it, luckily the tone in the script made this make sense, but I wanted to do everything in the pilot to then give us license to do it later. I was mm. like, if we have handheld lockdown dolly and steady cam in the pilot, we can do anything in right. series. Yeah. And cause I don't want to introduce a steady cam for the first time, like in episode five. Yeah. So, um, luckily the script worked with that, but like, it was really that first, I think it's that first t- talk with them when I explained the look they were so dialed in that they just kind of like let me run with it there was really no pushback yeah and you know in monitors everybody was so into it and every now and then we'd make little adjustments but like I think it, it, it was a it was a rare show in that like the creative people behind the, the scenes like Rory and Anthony and Scott and when Betsy and Carl the DP and I like we all saw the same show yeah I don't think we ever had like a real disagreement sometimes we'd be like should we do this or should we do this? Like sometimes that would happen, but in general, like if the AD came up and asked a question, like we would almost all answer it the exact same way. Or, yeah, that's you know, awesome. Um, vice versa. It was just, yeah, we were just on the flow together. It was really, it was really cool, but they trusted me, man. They just let me go with it. And it was, it was fun because I got to like be more vocal about, you know, things that normally you have to kind of like let go as an episodic director. I'd right? be like, no, 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 we can't do that. That's not going to look good. We have to do this. And, the, the, you know, being producing director on the show after the pilot gave me, you know, more of a voice to be able to, like, chime in and, and you know, try to nix things or at least say, wait, can we at least look at another option? Right. And um, did you know when you were shooting the pilot, had it been picked up yet or was it it was still just the pilot was a one off, but you were hoping that it would get picked yeah, up? And, yeah. Okay. But, yeah. Pilot was just, yeah, it was just the pilot. And then when it got picked up, I was like, you know, I'd love to be producing director and directors many of them and they were down with it because you know i was already like so heavily involved in the creative discussions that it made sense for me to be producing director yeah so yeah it, yeah we had no idea but like we knew while we were shooting it i was like they're gonna pick this up they'd be crazy not to pick this up especially with just the cast that we have i mean yeah. it's just like it's crazy it's rory and Bo bridges how the hell did we have Bo bridges <laughs> in a comedy central show right. like and like Mary Holland and Shears and I, like it's a crazy, crazy cast. No, it's it's yeah, a it's a really it's good great. show. It has a nice lived in feel too, like you said, just sort of you know with the wardrobe and all. And it's a, you know, it's a lower middle class family that he's from. You know, it's it's kind of the, it feels like the neighborhood I grew up in. It's the, the type of houses and just you know the the ice cream parlor, the bowling alley. It just all feels 
real, yeah. I guess, in a way. Yeah, the lived in thing was just essential. And I think a lot of it was we were able to shoot, you know, I feel so bad for our line producer because I think we were supposed to shoot more stuff on stage and we ended up being like way more on location. Yeah. Because the locations there are just so rich and like, they're just so like, you know, you sing lived in, it's so perfect. Like we would walk into a place and be like, Oh my God, do we even have to do anything to this? Right. We could just start shooting. Yeah. You know, for instance, like in the ice cream place we were in, they had like an old, like uh four by three, you know, standard deaf TV on the wall. And yeah. then they had a, uh, but then we wanted like a more, we wanted a flat screen one just for this one scene. And I was like, well, leave the other one up and have it off. Cause I believe that this place would have just left the mounted <laughs> TV on and like, have this one next to it and it looks so real it looks like it almost looks like the location wouldn't let us take it off which is what i love right so so yeah there was a lot of that and then we'd go in and like every place had like an oscillating everybody had the same black oscillating fan so i was like i want these on almost any set because this just <laughs> seems like part of the show now right so yeah it was it was it was a blast it was so fun shooting that stuff yeah and it's all stuff that like when when you come across it in real life it just works, but it's probably not something you would you would necessarily think to put on a stage. No, no. Oh my God, we would have never. Like the fan thing would have never been us. I would have. It was like one day where we scouted like the bowling alley, like two ice cream parlors, and then one other place. And like I'm like, I swear to God, this same fan is following us everywhere we go. <laughs> and then we're like, well, this is clearly a thing, so we have to like we have to put it in the show. So then yeah, we just started including fans. It was great. That's That's awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Payman. This is uh, this has been fun, and uh, you know, I yeah, man. L- like you, I, I'm I'm ready to get back to work now, but uh, also don't want to go back anytime soon if it's you know. We'll go when it's time. <laughs> All right, Payman Benz. There we go. I I enjoyed that. I hope you did too. Hope you got something out of it. All right. On Thursday, we got a brand new show as well. I'm going to be talking to my pal, maker, YouTuber, Jimmy Duresta. And if you know me, you probably know Jimmy as well. Jimmy is a, he's a carpenter. He's a metal worker. He's a kind of jack of all trades that puts his stuff up on YouTube. But the conversation we have on Thursday is uh, it's not about making. It's much more about the YouTube side of it, of making content. Because I think like Payman and I were talking about just now, we're all trying to figure out how to stay creative, how to how to make money, how to keep doing the stuff we love while we're stuck at home. And YouTube feels like a, a viable way to do that. So tune in Thursday for Jimmy DeResta. Please, uh, if you enjoyed this show, leave it a rating, leave it a review, subscribe, come back for more. I'm at Heath Rosella on Twitter and Instagram. Leave me a note. Let me know what you liked. Talk to you Thursday. Stay safe.